you know, we're not like the lack of, you know, these school district administrators are raising, that we are aware that there's other issues and that it takes time to solve some of those issues, but we're not ignoring them and we're not thinking that they're just going to go away. So I just wanted to kind of make that real. has some factual information about what it is and where the resources go. Before we start to get into that, though, January is School Board Recognition Month, and as you know, Mr. O'Neill has been putting out information about each of you, uh, and a little bit of quote, and tidbit about you and your service to the Oregon School District, so before you, you have a little gift bag, we'd just love to say thank you publicly for everything that each of you does in your volunteer work to help make this district special. Uh, each of you is an advocate for students and a representative of your community, and you absolutely take that to heart with how you incorporate voice and sharing information, and I know many of you get texts at all times and hours and nights and weekends, and uh, you're doing everything you can to help make sure people are heard and listen and valued. So thank you for everything that you do, and I wish you a happy January School Board Appreciation Month. Thank you. Okay, Kat and I are going to share some information about our enrichment program and operations. Uh, you're going to come up to the podium and share some information. And just wanted to make sure that you as a board and our community are clear on what this is and why it's important for our school system. The enrichment program and operations levy used to be called the maintenance and operations levy. And after the McCleary decision, it was deemed that since the state was reportedly fully funding education, that a levy can only go to things that the state of Washington is not paying for. So by law, that term was changed from maintenance to enrichment, and that essentially means that anything that is not covered by the state funding can be uh, and is paid for by the levy, which includes staffing, material supplies, and operating costs. 
This time around, the Oregon School District is going to move to a four-year levy. Historically, we've been a two-year levy. And this gives us longer-term ability to plan for and utilize levy funding. So when we bring on a sport or a club or an invention, we know that we'll have some sustainability and affordability for several years uh, to come. This time around, we're asking for a little bit less than last time. We're asking for uh, what we estimate to be a dollar eighty-eight per thousand of assessed valuation. A levy is a simple majority vote. So of the total people that vote, 50% plus one person is what is required. There's no validation requirement. When you go for a bond, you need a certain percentage of the previous election. A levy is different. It's just half plus one of whoever votes in that election. Looking historically, Oregon's tax rate has been higher than what we're asking for because we didn't have the assessed valuation that we do now. So when we're asking for a certain amount and there's more homes and more people to divide that by, the tax rate goes down. So in 12 and then 14, 16, we were hovering about that $4 rate. Last time we asked for voters for 207 per thousand. This time our estimate is $1.88 per thousand. Looking at what changes in the Oregon School District over the next four years, we know growth is a factor. The Tahali neighborhood alone, we estimate to bring in 1,300 homes to the school district. Uh, about another 1,200 between uplands and day breaks. So that's 2,600 homes that are coming. And when we think about the things that make us a community, whether that's extracurricular activities, athletics, performing arts, we not only want to build and grow those programs, but we have to be able to support those in light of growth. And we know it's going to take some resources to do that. That 2,600 homes could be up to 1,300 additional students. So we want to make sure that as we focus on uh, whatever it is that we deem important to this community that we're able to sustain that over a period of time. And that's where the four years come in. So ballots we anticipate will come uh, around the end of this week. Uh, we put a mailer out to families that should have received that within the last week. And that's not just our district families, that's any residents within the Oregon city limits, or Oregon school district limits rather. The election itself will be on the 8th. So uh, we would expect a first glimpse of results by about 8 o'clock that night. Uh, the election will be certified on the 18th. So where do these resources go? That's where Cabinet's going to help share some key information about what does the levy provide for in the Oregon School District that is in Richmond. So uh, one part of the levy dollars is talking about athletics. Athletics are really, really important to kids. Um, it goes beyond a Friday night sort of game that we all get to go to and watch. Um, there are a lot of benefits to this that we'll get into later about our goals. And, uh, but just to know what the uh, levy funds is really our coaches, referees, officials. Um, our facilities are funded through levy dollars. The transportation is funded by levy dollars. And uh, the new sports we have this year in the middle school, as well as our JV sports at high school, are funded through levy dollars. A uh, really important aspect to know about Oregon is that we don't ask our kids to pay when they play. And so sports for them are free. And so plenty of dollars go into that. Um, I think it's actually a good use for equity as well. So next slide. Another part of levy dollars is really around uh, extracurricular activities. Uh, one thing that uh, has been a big success this year we talked about before is the activity bus. It allows kids to stay after school and get the extra help they need. Uh, the visual arts and performing arts uh, instruments cost thousands of dollars, and that comes out of levy dollars. Our club advisors, transportation to and from those things, participation, we're all kind of funded. Uh, the student community service opportunities, you remember about a month ago, we collected about 40,000 pounds of food. Well, that and I have throwback still from that, but uh, <laughs> that was allowed you know, we did, uh, by student community service groups that were funded through the dollars. And uh, the relevant connected learning is really important as well for us to really take a look at that. That's why I point out a picture in the bottom middle there. Is this your seniors back when they were in sixth grade? Yeah. Uh, had a concert, but, so. <laughs> so, as most of you know, um, the money helps pay for our special education programs. Um, we're currently at about 15% special education in the school district. We are only funded to 13.5% which means that the levy needs, picks up about 2.07% or a little over 400, $450,000. Um, the state also funds uh, school psychologists. So look at that measly number at 0 0.06. And we have approximately four special psychologists in the district. Um, we also have three out of district placements, which are all each over $100,000 apiece. Uh, when it comes to our health services, uh, the state funds 0.37 nurses. Uh, we currently have 
1.7 RN, three LPNs, and one health, one health tech. Uh, COVID, uh, we also are uh, employing a couple of health techs as well as uh, another LPN to help with the test state program. School counselors um, are funded at a little higher level at five counselors um, in this district of Transportation. Um, Aaron talked a lot about uh, the activity buses. So far, we've transported 844 students after school programs. So, um, Megan has done an incredible job in organizing that, even given all the things that are going on with our transportation and transportation in the local area. We're still able to do our after school programs and actually transport those kids. Um, athletic buses as well. Um, one of the things that the lady pays for is our athletic buses. And so far this year, during the 21 22 school year, they've traveled 4,534 miles this year. Um, we've transported 2,300 students uh, this year, 20, 78,000 miles. Last year, even in a hybrid year, buses traveled 123,000 miles. The final thing in regards to transportation is the buses. Um, we've done a nice job, thanks to Marcy um, and Megan. Um, we're able to actually um, purchase and purchase two small buses and an additional two large buses uh, during the school year. Next. Safety and security. All our safety and security cameras are up and running. Um, for all the nooks and crannies to keep our kids safe and uh, during the weekend. Um, when things may happen in the um, Secure entrances at both of our elementary schools. We actually updated all of our radios this year. So now we can talk from PTR, all the way over to the maintenance building. We were able to do that before. And actually, the radios now have a distance all the way to the quarry uh, entrance, uh, which we didn't have before, which will be very helpful during our uh, hard drill this coming school year. We also purchased two repeaters. One of those repeaters is going to be used for transportation, um, and that will allow us to um, communicate with buses up towards Holland and up towards Prairie Ridge. Um, right now, uh, if you don't already know, um, we're communicating between buses. Bus one talks to bus two, and bus two talks to the main off, you know, the main uh, base station. So we're trying to get away from that, and that's not a good way to keep our kids safe. Um, the MOU uh, City Board, which are going to pay for, um, for that. and then finally we belong to a safety cooperative, uh, which keeps us in line with all the safety regulations for the school. <coughs> Technology in the hands of kids never became more important than it did when the COVID hit and we had to go into full remote learning. Fortunately, with the time when that happened, we were at a one-to-one -one student to device ratio, and we're at that ratio right now. And what we've got, we were able to do that through general fund uh, supported with levy dollars, that your existing levy dollars. Now we've got the challenge and the responsibility to continue to update and keep current our, the devices in the hands of our kids. So we're looking at ways of a leasing program that will do that. Um, as well, the infrastructure that's required to do that kind of work, the more devices we have, the more people we have on it. We are utilizing about half of what we have available to us in terms of bandwidth. And so to actualize the, uh, what's available to us is going to take some additional infrastructure and equipment that we're going to need to do that. And then the, my little uh, icon up there in the upper left-hand corner is to represent 1.3 people, which is what the state funds for technology services in the district. We have five people on our uh, staff. One of them is funded through CTE dollars, but the other, the other uh, three point what is that? 3.7, right? Is my math right? Okay. 3.7 are funded, are funded by us. That, you've seen that picture before, the multi-tiered systems of support and what we are conceptualizing to address our goals and our, our core commitment to each and every student. And as we later this evening talk to you about our strategic plan and our goals around our strategic plan, I think you'll see what's probably inherent in that is a great deal of need around professional learning. So, and this is at all areas, teachers, certificate staff, 
So the work that the, the state pays for three days of certificated teacher learning that is designated in the contract, the work that we're doing is all outside of that. Uh, Aaron and I were just last night with a group of elementary teachers working on ELA, and tonight we just walked out of a meeting with elementary teachers working on math. Those teachers are here after school from 4 to 5.30 after the school day, and we're stipending them for that work because what we would typically do in that, which is replace them with a substitute teacher in the classroom, and then we would do that during the work day, we just can't do that. Um, in fact, Christy asked me to teach second grade tomorrow, so I'm a little bit about If you want some pointers. all my years of teaching second grade, that could be very interesting. So um, anyway, so this is a really important need that we have. We also want to tell you a little bit about staff and substitutes. And you can see here that we have 324 staff members, and uh, many of those positions are not funded by the state. Uh, but we need them to assist and move to forward with their learning and growth. You can see here that of those 324, the state gives us the equivalency of 107 first times four days of substitute pay. So what that means is of our 324 employees, all of which who can get 10 to 12 days of sick leave per year, for example, uh, that the state will only reimburse us or give us the money for 107 of those at four days per person. So you can see there that the amount of money is $65,000, and yet um, for what is typical absences by uh, if I need a substitute, you can see that if you add what the certificated line looks like for the corresponding classified line in the same year, that we are spending between five and six hundred thousand uh, dollars over, you know, in total. So quite a bit more than the sixty-five thousand that is sent our way. We have no state funding for our classified employees who require substitutes uh, and legitimately have the ability to do that. We also wanted to share a little bit of information about facilities. You can see here that we are funded by the state for uh, shy of four maintenance and grounds employees. Uh, you'd like to know that we have three maintenance employees, two grounds employees, that uh, they do an awesome job of keeping our district uh, running and, and uh, beautiful. And yet we don't even get the full funding for four, let alone the five that we have to make ends meet. Oh, we also have uh, less than 11 is what I put up here for custodial funding. It's actually closer to nine and a half and yet we have 15 custodians. And uh, so that funding, uh, that, that additional or excess funding does come from our levy dollars. We also have uh, things like roofing repairs. You likely saw earlier that uh, this year that we had stacks of roofing on top of PPR and also had some roofing over at OPS and the play shed. And that uh, just by $400,000 for our local dollars, as well as We've talked about in CPAC and other meetings that HVAC and boiler repairs that have been needed that, that uh, keep us warm when we need to be warm so that uh, everyone's staff and students can comfortably do their, their work. And then we know that we have the anticipated uh, staff, or excuse me, stadium turf replacement. And depending on when the quotes are being acquired, we've heard the amounts ranging from 600000 to a million dollars. We know that construction costs us somewhat risen recently, so that kind of a stand we're looking at and all of that as well. So we're putting information on our website at Replacement Levy under that header. Happy to answer any questions you may have. We are making our rounds to all of our staff trying to get the word out. We've been in transportation, facilities. We have high school next week, and I believe we'll talk about a couple of public opportunities for us to share this information in other forums and allow some question and answer. So we're working on getting our word out and telling our story. Do you, any of you have any questions for any of us at this point in time? I have no questions, but I do want to say bravo. Um, there's some very detailed information in there that goes beyond the idea of a living for athletics and clubs. And so um, I'm very much a person that likes to know the why of things and it helps.
help me uh, make better decisions for sure. Um, so fantastic job on getting those bits of real information in there so that people can see that while the state pays for um, education, that even it doesn't cover the cost of all of our, our teachers' needs. Um, so just great job. Thank you. That concludes my report. I will say the levy in aggregate makes up about 10% of our total operating budget. Uh, um, I just wanted to make sure that people know, because I had a few people ask me, that we're not, even, the levy has nothing to do with anything going on on the hills. Because they, when they see that slide, they think some of them thought, well, why are we, why are we, you know, doing that right now? And I said, no, it's not. But so just, like, maybe sometimes if you're talking to people, just to make sure that they know that we're not doing anything right now at any of the other places. This is for them. Yeah. I, just, I just had a couple calls on that. And, uh, you will have, uh, in further plan, a little bit of an update, consideration of what the CPAC, where the CPAC left off, our team will be bringing to you probably March or sometime where we would say a longer term plan to address growth. Yeah. Bonds are how we would address that through building, bonds building, levies learning. So this is really direct impact, not that facilities don't impact yet, but the direct impact of the programs and things that we offer to support in the classroom, enrichment, and things that aren't covered by the state as well as after school. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay, that concludes my report. Thank you. All right, so looks like Liz is up next with this facility update. We do. We have Liz Leroy with Alliance and Matt Rumbaugh from NAC Architecture. And they're going to share a little bit of an update of what we've been up to on the facility side. And I believe you'll see them again after our board workshop next month. Well, you're going to see a lot of them over the next several <laughs> months and probably years, as a matter of fact. Uh, Matt, Liz? Nice to see everyone. <laughs> Happy New Year. Um, I don't have much of an update. I'm really actually going to pass it over to Matt. We've been um, at a high level. We've been definitely starting to work through some contracts and they can see proposals for a lot of the work that the structural and that team is doing. So it's a good thing to do. And then I know you guys can see some of the other things that we're going to do. And then I'm going to get to the back. And then I'm going to get to the back. We jokingly kind of started that conversation off with it's good to know what to expect and you're expecting, right? Mm -hmm. We've been focusing on that kind of work, preparatory work, to be able to present some different ideas to you and have a discussion that can be vigorous and uh, meaningful. And so that, some of that preparation includes things like starting to do a deeper dive into the information that we draw from the seat. That includes the population growth, student growth numbers, really understanding uh, in uh, kind of a more finite detail in how that affects each of the different buildings and how we can start to think through uh, different scenarios related to that. The other piece we're doing is they're starting to do a uh, much more analysis at the high school because one of the things that's really challenging is figuring out what's the best way to over a number, a series of bond measures over a long-term phase plan to redevelop the high school. And so some of the things we're doing to really better understand that are just today we have the structural engineer out to look at a few of the buildings so that we can understand what are the ramifications of renovating this building, what are the things that we need to be aware of, and make sure that our plan properly accounts for that. <coughs> we're also kind of doing a similar thing with mechanical systems, and you saw that mentioned on the slide here a few minutes ago that that's one of the things we want to make sure that our, our plan really incorporates that. So, and then, then lastly, on the, from an architectural perspective, also kind of just started to think about and explore some different uh, layouts for how this could happen. So that's what we're just starting to do. Um, so hopefully when we come to, come to you and get to talk to you in February, we'll have some good, good background information as well as some initial ideas that then we can start bouncing I would just add, at this point in time, your council and I have met with all of our major developers beginning to establish a relationship and getting that conversation going. 
uh, to really look at what does the future look like and reconfirming their plans. They have not only short-term impact potentially with enrollment, but obviously longer-term considerations for us about how we plan phase in facilities. So uh, those conversations have been continuing to happen and we'll have another update for you next time we meet.
We'll pay for big things out of there. We pay for the growth replacement out of there. Should we, um, should the turf replacement happen this year, we will probably be requesting to transfer money from general funds to capital projects to pay for that. Large projects have to be paid out of that fund. Mm -hmm. It's one of the accounting rules of the state. Transportation vehicle fund. That is used to buy our yellow buses. So it's not all vehicles, it's just the yellow buses. Um, money is into that account from depreciation that the state gives us for each bus we have. Um, I can say that the depreciation we get from the state does not cover the cost of the new bus once it's off of their depreciation schedule, which is why we need local funds and levy to help buy new buses. And that's something our levy has always supported is helping us buy more buses. Um, the last one is the private purpose trust fund. Mostly that's used for our um, scholarships. So there's some local scholarships that are specific to our school district. And people have set up foundations over the year with our district. That's where the money sits. And so each year, a high school um, has staff that the students fill out applications and or essays. They go through it, and then we get the information to uh, who gets those. And then we pay it out directly to the school that the students go to. Um, so each fund does have its own specific budget, which comes to you guys in the form of the F-195. We usually present that in July as the first run, and then August is when you guys usually meet to adopt it with the public service. We usually create a budget summary to try to help explain the information in a more, in, more readable format for people because the F-195 is a lot of time and data that doesn't always make a lot of sense getting those. <laughs> um, major components of the school budget. The beginning fund balance, the revenues, the expenditures, transfers, and the ending fund balance. Those are the biggest parts of it. Um, all these numbers are from our current adopted 2022 budget for the beginning and ending fund balances. We're required to adopt a balanced budget, and it can't have a negative ending fund balance. We have to have a positive. We have manuals with the state um, that we're required to go by. So OSPI is the big one that we have to go by, whatever they say. The county manual for school districts determines how things are paid for, what funds are paid out of, and how, what account code structure we use. And then the administrative, I never call it this, but fun. The administrative budgeting and financial reporting handbook, which is also called the ABFR, is another guidelines that we have to go by. So the beginning and the ending fund balance. There's components of the, end, of the fund balance, the beginning and the ending. We have non-spendable, which is inventories and prepaid items. Restricted, which is legally restricted by the statute or a WAC, or Washington Administrative Code, we don't want to use put those out there. Um, committed part of the fund balance is limitations placed by usage by the school board. Um, assigned means it's set aside for, by the district for a very specific use or unassigned, which can be used for any purpose that we have. Um, we do have a board policy that requires us to set aside 5% for 5% of our budgeted expenditures in the fund balance in an assigned category. So our 5% for this year is 2 million one. So that's included in our beginning and ending fund balance along with some other pots of funds. There are restricted, um, <coughs> the restricted carryovers at the year end are there's certain sets of funds that we get that have to be spent on a specific purpose. So like CPE funds have to be set, spent on CPE. If we carry it over, it carries over the next year in the restricted balance, and has to be spent on CPE for the next year. Revenues. Sources of revenues. Our state, which is state approved grant and our apportionment. Local, which is taxes, fines, and any fees that happen. We don't have a lot of um, fees we charge students anymore, which is great, but fines would go into that category too. Federal, which would be grants, and then food services, a federal program, so that would be in there as well. And other, which is a very small category, is if other districts have paid it for our services. We really don't have a lot of services with, uh, that other districts would pay us for. We need to have a a vision specialist that we employ that other districts would use because we didn't need a bully. So that would fall in that category because we don't have that anymore as an employee of our district. Um, the majority of our funding goes through the apportionment process. They give us the money by the typical <coughs> funding model, which means as they presented in the levy information, we 
we get a specific amount of FTE based on our students. So our students drive the FTE we're given for a lot of positions, and then they fund us by a specific dollar amount for each one of those FTEs, plus saving benefits, and that's our more major, our major funding source. Um, Where does the money come from? Like I said, we have about 10% that is our levy. We have 15, that's about the state categorical. Uh, about 50% of the state apportionment, and then the rest are federal funds and private foundations, which isn't very much either. So. And then of course fees are less than 3%. Because we don't talk about all of them. Expenditures. Expenditures this year are totaling around 43 million. The different components <coughs> that we're required by OSPI to categorize our expenditures. The biggest parts are the program, which is in red over there is the 9700 portion. That's the program, PPSS, for us, is program, subprogram. They dictate the program part in the first two digits. The district can then break it up by the second two digits of that number that doesn't get reported. Um, we're also required to report by activity, which is 11 is the board. So I use this as a, this account code is a sample for code for board of directors going to a conference. This is the account code that we would use. So, the program 9700 is also called district-wide expenses. The 11 is board of directors, and 7330 is specific to um, conference fees. And then the last part that we're also required to do now is the very last digit, which is the zero. The zero means it's coming from um, federal or state sources. We use a one if it's coming from local sources. So we have many, many account codes in the district. Um, all determined by the state, but that is a sample of what it looks like for our expenditure plan. So the part of the account code that is the program, this is a listing, and I'm not going to read all to you, of multiple different account codes, program codes that we use. Every program has its own code. So if we have um, ALE students, that's a different program code than basic ed. We have an open doors program, that's a different program code. Um, we have Title I, LAP, et cetera. All of our different program codes are generate their own set of account codes afterwards. So we have thousands and thousands of account codes. The activity code. So there's some general categories of activity codes in this. Anything that starts with a one is an administrative, starts with a two is an instructional. And I'm talking about in the AA part of the first number. The second number determines what it is. So 11 is board, 12 is superintendent's office, 13 is business services. These are all considered administration. 20 is instruction. So 21 is um, supervision. 25 is another supervision for, um, 27 is teaching. 28 is athletics, activities. So those are all part of instructional. 30 is instructional support, so 31 is right now it's professional development and that's the instructional system. 40 is food services. 42 is for food specifically. 44 is for um, food service purchases that are not food. <laughs> stuff. There is some stuff we have to buy when we say for you. Um, 50 are student transportation. 52 is actually to and from school bus stuff. 53 is more of, this, of um, like 53 is more of the um, fixing of us. So the different parts of each one. 60 is maintenance operations, 70 is other services. We don't have a lot of those that go there. 80 is debt service, also not a lot that happens in general public debt service. And 90 is public activities, but it's also administrative. So 9700 is um, for 9700 is specific to all district-wide activities, although it's also called public activities. The object part of the account code. Um, so in the picture in the red, we're talking about the first digit, really the seven, that part of it. Um, the two, anything that starts with the two is called certificated salary. So it has to have, someone who has to have a certificate is paid out of something starting with a two. If there's anything besides that, it starts with a three, which we call classified employees. Every benefit code in our district starts with a four. There's multiple benefit codes, but they all start with fours, and that is benefits and payroll tax. Um, a five would be supplies, seven is purchase services, eight is travel, and nine is capital outlays. 
capital outlay is um, it pretty much a single purchase, a single item purchase that costs over five thousand dollars. Something you'd be more likely to have in an inventory, or something that like a, a bus, not, well, a, a bus or a car or a no, <laughs> so they'll be buying the same. Lower or nothing good. Um, the transfer section. We have transfers in and out of the dips, in and out of general fund. The biggest one we do, and I bring it to the board each year, is transfers to TVS or transportation vehicle fund for the cost for the purchase of buses. So a transfer out would be in that category. Um, Non-voted debt payments would go in the transfers category also. Um, construction or acquisition, like if we um, fixed, if we fix the turf and we fix the roof, transfers were in that category. So this year's budget, we had 966,000 that we could that the board approved that we could be transferred to another fund. So the bulk of the school districts have constant elements. Um, bulk of it is earmarked for specific purposes, and then revisiting the object codes that we get to go by for all of our purchases. Everything gets categorized into one of those purchases, one of those accounts. Broke down by account code. Well, this is an, um, is an odd year. Normally, our employee-related costs are usually closer to 80 percent, and our supplies are closer to 20 percent. This year is a little bit off, um, and that's only because I projected I projected um, something that seemed like a good idea at the time. All the revenues and expenditures for the ESSER funding, I projected us to receive all the revenues this year and expend it all. That made this normal 80-20% a bit off. We're not going to spend all of our ESSER funds this year, and we're not going to receive all of our ESSER funds this year, but that did make this look a little funny. Um, major uses of supplies. So, what do we buy? We buy school School supplies, program supplies, curriculums, we pay for utilities, liability insurance, professional development, technology, small work projects when we work done on a building that our own workers can't do. Um, and then items, another part that in the budget that we plan for is um, items identified in any of our long-term plans. So, I think that is it. Do you have any questions I can help with?
Oh, oh, so it is a it's prepared by, if you have any questions about this uh, um, October and November, I believe we're both include this month because of um, not being one back to the And I love that you explained that right there. I didn't have to wonder very <laughs> much. starting to 
double up in homes in the area because they want to win. Honestly, the thing I hear more often than not is that they want to stay here in Oregon and they'll do anything they possibly can to stay here in Oregon. Experiencing trauma such as losing a family member. We just had a, we just had a truancy board the other day. We, couldn't, we were trying to figure out how to support the child. The dad uh, from COVID-19. And so we had to figure out some things and we actually were able to get her some counseling uh, through through our school district and through our current our current MOUs. So one of the things that I did was I took a look at all this data. Well, I had to mix my head spin, so please bear with it. Um, is the fact that um, every year, every yeah, every year, uh, the Healthy Year survey is good, and we also gave a COVID-19 student survey last year. We got the results back in June. One of the things you'll notice is that people's perception, and that's really important, these are kids' perceptions. 57% of our students perceive the fact that they're failing. Commitment to school. We have 44% of our students who feel committed to having, or committed to school, that they're committed to being in school and learning and graduating. In regards to opportunities for pro-social involvement, 58%. That means 48% 40, of the kids don't really feel like they have a, a place. And that's why it's so important right now for us to really take a look at the, we talked about the activity bus, Providing more opportunities for kids who don't have those opportunities before, so it's all about access. Um, we also um, took information in regards to the COVID-19 the COVID survey, is that right now that um, students felt their expressed interest in student well-being, they didn't feel at that point that, and it was harder because we're talking about, we're talking about remote learning. Students felt isolated, they didn't feel like they were cared for as much as we tried over that. So what I'm trying to portray here is that we have a lot of need as it relates to as it relates to the pandemic. I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm really so one of the second leading suicide is the second leading uh, cause of death for kids ages 15 to 24. 25 percent of our youth are experiencing depressive symptoms and 20 percent are experiencing anxiety symptoms due to the pandemic. This came, this came from the U.S. Surgeon General um, recently, uh, about two months ago, um, and he put out an advisory similar to a mental health advisory, very similar to anything else. So, anything else. <coughs> so in regards to the survey that was given out, 50, 50, 58, <laughs> yeah, I just said it work. No, no. Almost 60% of our students at the high school felt depressed in most, most days. 44% of our middle school students. 12% of our student respondents find a suicide attempt. 10% of our middle schoolers. 16% considered attempting suicide. 13% of middle school respondents considered attempting suicide. 3% actually attempted it. And 2% middle school respondents attempted suicide as well. 15% uh, of our middle school students tried to get help. So we have students wanting to get help. Here's the problem with the pandemic last year. Access to services was limited, if not, and here's the thing. One of the things that our wonderful healthcare system did, they created these portals that we actually spent hours on trying to get kids access to the portal. Um, and kids were using their phones, people were trying to get access. What was happening is, is that they kids got frustrated with the technology and didn't end up getting access to those services that they needed. So, as a result of depression, as a result of uh, not feeling really great about school, what do they do? They have outlets. And so, now here's the thing about cigarettes and smoking and all of those things. We're not, kids aren't smoking cigarettes anymore. They're vaping. You know, I mean, in fact, I was talking to the principals and they said, we haven't busted kids for cigarettes. Uh, we haven't busted kids for cigarettes in the last four years. It's all, it's all making them. And so um, we have, at the high school, 24% of our students, 24% of the respondents, and we're talking about, you know, close to 300 respondents, 
Um, actually, um, they're using e-cigarettes right now. 27% drink alcohol, and 17% have used marijuana. So one of the things that we want to take a look at, and we're going to be talking about this a little bit more in um, about our goals for the coming school year. One of them is obviously connected to building on those community relationships. And all the things that I gave you earlier on was the fact that when we take a look at those, it's, it, those are the barriers to learning. Uh, kids cannot learn if they don't have the, essential, have the essential needs taken care of. And that includes social emotional supports. And this is all through our multi-tier system <coughs> support. So, one of the things community partnerships need to be is the needed supports and services are fluid. You have to be there when the kids need them. All right? They just can't be there at certain times of the day. They can't be there at certain times of the week. They can't be there only at, um, in November. They have to be there when the kids need them. Um, the tiers are layered. Kids, kids need them at certain times of the year. I'll tell you right now, in September, we had a big need. We had a big need for services uh, in our school district. We need to make sure that we're disseminating these resources and promoting them at all. So, for example, with our community and with our, and with our teachers, we want to make sure that they have the information they need in order to make informed decisions including our teachers, inform decisions about the supports that are available and the support and then what the supports are being used for. So they need to know as well. They can't make a referral. They can't, they, they need to know what's available for the students. And then we want to make sure that we provide intensive targeted services and supports at the individual group and family level. We're not only talking about services for our students, we're also talking about parent training. We're talking about uh, the parents need um, support with getting their kids to school, getting gas cards. Uh, we make sure that they have the clothes they need. Uh, we want to make sure that they have the food on the weekends. And Megan was telling me before I got here today that we have between 12 and 20 backpacks that go home every weekend uh, for our kids from the boarding food day. As part of the tiered approach, uh, we have multiple different services available to our students. And I'm going to start with Tier 1. And basically, what we need to be doing is, like I said, they need to know the symptoms of mental health. The teachers need to know those things. So in Tier 1, we have to make sure that our staff are literate regarding mental health. Just like anything else, people feel, honestly, our teachers feel really confident, well, not really, only confident around teaching where you but they're not really competent around the literacy around mental health. They're not really competent around the literacy of poverty. They're not really literate regarding our community and what services are available. So we have a responsibility in tier one to make sure that they understand and know all of what's available and then how to determine how they can help support their kids. When we get to tier two, we're talking about groups of kids. We're talking about social skills groups. We're talking about check-in and check-out. We're talking about behavior contracting. And so right now, um, we have comprehensive life resources um, and the Recovery Cafe providing group therapy in our schools. We grab the basic needs. We have the Ordy Family Resource Center, which has been part of this community forever. Um, the Ordy Food Bank, our faith community. The Ordy, the Ordy uh, Methodist Church now has a... Uh, a clothing bag, and I'm actually looking at putting some resources in and talking to, uh, we don't have any laundry facilities, and helping support our families with, um, honestly, with our kids. Nothing makes a kid feel better than clean clothes. And so um, we've been talking there, we're actually going to be doing some another MOU regarding laundry facilities. Um, the Oregon Haven. And then the Oregon Haven has supported us. Actually, they've done a lot of good job. You know, Rick's the uh, manager there, and they did some things regarding the um, the baking during the early part of the school year. And they've also helped us help with a number of our students um, that are really struggling, including homelessness. Um, and then we also have um, our tier three, and we have a variety of different things. But those tier three students, a very small number of students. Uh, where we're actually providing social services, wraparound services. So for example, our, community, our comprehensive life resources provides case management for our kids. 
um, and their families. Because um, sometimes you provide kids with therapy, they also need case management support as well. These here, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about those partnerships, and I'll explain this uh, briefly. But one of the things that we want to do is to make sure that we're hitting all, hitting all cylinders regarding our relationships. It's not just about social services. It's not just about um, the mental health pieces. But it's also about city governance. It's also about how do we, how do we enlist our city um, to provide supports and services for our kids. How do we get our service organizations in the community involved? Um, I don't know, uh, let's see, Chamber of Commerce. I don't know if I was but you know, the Chamber of Commerce. How do we get those agencies involved? How do we get more involved um, with our, honestly, our, we just had a conversation with our um, parent-teacher organization. How can they be more involved in supporting our kids? So there's several ways that we actually engage in community partnerships. Um, so the first one is, is actually called the Washington Integrated Student Supports Protocol. Basically, we can use our LAC dollars, our learning assistance program dollars, up to 15% of those dollars for developing relationships and contracts with our, with our um, community. The next one are memorandums of understanding. Uh, that's another way of doing it. Most of our, most of our work with our mental health uh, providers are all done through um, memorandums of understanding. There's no way that goes between the district and the, and the agency. The next ones are direct contracts. You've seen those. You can read the, you can read what, the amount of money that we're putting into direct contracts. Um, and then the jump rate says that we're able to access the 1% debt on um, behavioral health. And we're doing that through comprehensive like resources. Um, and they're providing what they call um, School Connect. And they've been supporting us with training this year as well. Um, and then finally, coalition relationships. We have, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But those are the coalition relationships, the Prairie Ridge Coalition. We also have the Supporting Support Network. And we also have OSTA, which is another coalition. So we, the district's involved in three different coalitions to help support our kids in our community. So regarding the health and hunger nonprofits, we currently, we currently this year have been working with the health department regarding the health of our kids, including Keith. We had 20 to 30 kids actually participate in that this year. Highline College MLU helped us with all of our um, screenings this year. We had students coming in to help with our screenings. Mental health, comprehensive like resources, multi-care, Inseho, and then the Recovery Cafe got an extensive uh, grant this year to help provide group and individual therapy during school and after school hours. Behavioral health um, for our kids who are actually in tier, I'll call them our tier three kids, our kids that have significant behavioral and mental health needs. Um, that's with Behavior Bridges, Maximum Healthcare, Hopeful Hands, Behavior, Behavior Cusp, and then the Puget Sound Threat Assessment Cooperative. In regards to substance abuse prevention, we're working with the ESD. As you know, we have a substance abuse counselor now. She's actually, she actually has, so far this year, she's had 46 referrals. Uh, between the middle school and the high school. And so, um, Conseo Counseling Referral, they're actually doing groups uh, in the evening in collaboration in collaboration with the Recovery Cafe and all of our older kids, our high school kids. Um, and we're excited about the Recovery Cafe to figure out ways to get them there. Um, Hunger Nonprofit, we have our learning food bag and our care fund. So like I said, we have the weekend backpacks between 12 and 20 of those. And then our faith-based organizations, um, including the Oregon United Methodist Church, which provides clothing and diaper bank. So one of the things I wanted to share, and I just got this information. So um, people ask, well, how many kids are accessing those mental health services? So, so far this year, so far this year, we put mental health services alone. We have 23 referrals at the high school, 28 at the middle school, 26 at Oregon Primary School, and six at the PTR. Um, and like I said, we had 46 referrals for the drug and alcohol, uh, drug and alcohol counseling. Other nonprofits, Family Support Center, we have a brand new person who works over there, coordinator. Uh, we have Brandon Heather, uh, who will provide parent training, health care, and utility support. Teen Haven, uh, Teen Support, and they also have a clothing bag. And finally, uh, we also have the support network. 
um, that meets the first Monday of each month. They were responsible, thanks to the Port and Haven, they were responsible for putting together the, the this whole group, putting together the um, holiday giving and also the, um, the supply drive in August. Um, we have the Oregon Standing Together on Prevention, uh, which we're almost finished with our strategic plan. Um, that's been an interesting process. If you ever want to hear about details, work with a healthcare authority. And then um, they have the Prairie Ridge Community Coalition as well. And Ed and I had an opportunity for one of their night out events. We were able to be up there at the beginning of the school year. But I'm regularly involved with them. Uh, um, because we have 23 families that work up there and they help provide services to those kids up there. So, but one of the things we have to know all together on this is that we can't do it alone and we need to stay on it. And that's why it's one of our goals to keep, enrich it, um, enrich, those, enrich those relationships. Um, and um, sometimes all the pieces don't come together. Uh, I'll tell you, schools and agencies uh, community-based organizations, we don't talk the same speed. And so it's really about spending time because you have to spend time really trying to interpret what each other's talking about so that we can meet the needs of our students, our families, and other kids and other people in our community. So. Do you have any questions? So I, I, kind of, I was kind of heavy down here to start with. <laughs> Right. Uh, which I would love to see as well. 
And um, what I'm saying is like, yeah, we have to have people that are really aware of the, the vocabulary, um, the signs of it, uh, like we did for, um, we call it mental health first aid. We had a, a counselor at the middle school who was uh, uh, trained for mental health first aid. Uh, that would be another avenue to do that. But what you're talking about is pretty cool. And so, in regards to that, I won't be getting up in multi care. Multi care is a level, multi care is just, then, well, they're a big conglomerate. And so, anytime you ask them to do something different than they are, are actually doing, they fall down in the arm and then have to go up the corporate ladder. Um, I've been finding very, a lot of results from Genseo and a lot of results from comprehensive life resources. And honestly, locally with the recovery out there. So. I like, I, um, I like, I really, I like, I don't know, I don't know those counselors because that's what they did. They came in and they worked with those kids on, the, on yeah. those services. The other thing is, um, Conseil, now are we using them, like let's say a student gets suspended for drug use and are we using them to have to go there to come back to school? Well, that's why we have a substance abuse counselor now. So we have a substance abuse So we're using her in high school. Yeah. She, and, yes. and then what she does is she makes a referral uh, for intervention um, and also um, UA and things like that. So mm -hmm. can say it will be that kind of stuff. Um, but it's up to our substance abuse person. So we will, she will be doing things after school and she'll be doing things here with. So if kids get suspended for that kind of thing. She is there to do that for She's embedded in both the middle school and the high school okay. to do that kind of activity. That's good. Because I know it worked before. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because I, I, I didn't really understand um, all she was going to be doing, so thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. The big part of it is prevention. You know, yeah. Yeah. And we want to prevent it from happening. Um, so, I mean, that's a big piece, but she is, honestly, she is spending more time reacting. Um, and you're getting referrals, and she is getting right in right now. Um, but she is responsible for doing prevention work, too. And I like that we're looking at different types of counselors, because at the school level, they get so wrapped up in schedules and, and different kinds of things that when kids want to see them, it's hard sometimes to get them in you know, or, or to have them really work with them because they're, they're so busy, so. Well, and so here's the, the thing with comprehensive life resources. We were limited in the past by their, um, if they didn't have Apple Care, um, they weren't getting services. Oh, okay. And so now now working with comprehensive life resources and that 1% behavioral tax. Mm -hmm. So we can thank Mr. Bates for any more help. He can I'm not going to use that But he, he, he really championed this, and and he looked at it for a year, and he got it passed, and so that's how we ended up with comprehensive for like resources providing therapy to people that didn't qualify under awful care but had insurance and now are able to receive the services, and that's the same thing with the recovery cafe. Mm -hmm. They can take the other kids, and so before it was like, oh, they, they don't have awful care, so we can't get them services. Now they can. Thanks to the recovery cafe and the company of the health resources. Oh, sure. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, you got it. Oh, hey, Chris, I just want to say thank you for all the, the things we partnered on together uh, with Damon. <clears throat> I'm not feeling too well, excuse my voice. One thing I wanted to mention I didn't see on the wheel was fun. Mm -hmm. I, I love the fun, that that's what they need, you know, when it comes to the depression and the anxiety, it's just providing a fun environment too. Yeah. Um, so that, that's been a great thing. Um, the New Year's Eve party and just gift wrapping with them and hand, handmade Mother's Day cards when they come yeah. in and drop their backpacks off. We just, we always have a good, safe environment, but they have a lot of fun and, and every week they're bringing new friends with them. Um, so I feel like that's been probably the biggest factor uh, as to, to student retention and, and success at the Haven has just been a great place to, to go and have fun. Yeah. So thank you for, for all your partnership. Yeah, and, and Rick, one of the things, one of the things that is, when you take a look at the Healthy Youth Survey about pro-social involvement, that we have 40% of our kids who are seeking that out. They don't believe there's any opportunities for pro-social involvement. And so we need to work on that, what we consider that the fun, the fun stuff you're talking about, you know, the, the activities after school, you know, the haven with all the activities you're going on there. 
of making those social connections. Even so during we, school, it needs well, to be some kind of fun. I know, so when you take a look at it, 40% of our kids are saying we don't have any opportunities for personal involvement. So the idea of having activity buses and all the different things, we could absolutely do a, a better I'm saying this is better, a better job of creating those opportunities for our kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, one last question. Are we collecting data on like the behavior bridges and things to see if it's working? So that they have their job, their job is to collect information. And remember, we're talking with Maxim Healthcare, we're talking about eight kids. Mm -hmm. We're only talking eight kids. Right. And so we have that data to substantiate that day. I'm pretty proud of that data. So I can't mm -hmm. make it to the kids. Okay. And so um, I'd love, to, I'd love to share that because some of our kids are really making some good. Okay. Now, some of them are really struggling, mm -hmm. but we have another group of kids that are really making jobs, and so I'd love to share that sometime because it's, it's really, honestly, it's very impressive. Okay, great. I'm very That's excited about really it. I know people look at the, how much things cost, but when you see the kids that are actually making growth, um, that means more to me than anything. They're getting the right people, mm -hmm. the right people in the right places. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not sure when the best time. Is that like would be more appropriate for like a year end overview of student support services and how many kids were served and outcomes? And yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to do that. She's over. Yeah, don't forget. Year end. I'm sorry. When you think it's appropriate, when you have the data available. Oh, that would be fun. sharing a mid-year progress report by board policy that's supposed to be tied to the Washington School Improvement Framework. The data we have is from 2020, so it's old data, uh, but it's good data. We'd like to share a little bit of our historical of where we've been as a system and have you look through the lens of data from where we've been to where we're at. We have our fall data, testing data, that is not state released, but disaggregated enough for our intents and purposes to share with you where we are today. And then we'd like to combine that with uh, what normally at this point is a mid-year project report. As a board, you've asked our team to re-envision and re-plan our strategic plan. And tonight, we'd like to share what our recommendation would be around the strategic goals and measures of how we would move us forward. Previously, we shared draft mission, vision, theory of action. Uh, we made some revisions to what we shared as the draft goals last month. Uh, and we really think that we, uh, working together, these five areas will help us to raise achievement for every child in the Oregon School District. So, Mr. Rapp's going to kick this off. Yeah, our thanks to Mr. Willis for kind of setting the stage for that to show how complex the work is. And I just wish we had somebody more passionate about it. <laughs> and honestly, and honestly I, I don't know what a system does without Chris Willis. I didn't know that it was one of his targets when he came in to be involved in the community, but it's just when he said that, and I just thought to myself, it's just that as I learned, as I got to learn to know him, he sets his mind to something. So I tell you, so he really set us up well, and, and thank you, Jeff. We want to talk about what we've done, the work we've done to try to put strategic ideas in there. When I think about a strategic plan, there's a couple of different thoughts that hit me. One is that old saying, if you don't know where you're going, anybody can get you there. 
And you can imagine what that looks like. But I also like the other image of, of rowers. And that the best crew is the one that's in sync. And all the oars are going and they're tying. And, and so when we think about our strategic plan, we know that our, our previous one sunset on in 2020. And so now we're really looking at how are we identifying the targets that we're after so that we can really capitalize and focus on our resources that we have. Not just the financial resources that Marcy shared, but our personnel resources, our community resources. And when all those start driving in the right direction, amazing things can happen. I was thinking when Marcy was doing the budget talk and she, um, the other revenues, and she said, well, we don't have very much of that people paying us for our services. And the first thought in my mind was, yes. Three to five years from now, you wait. And we'll see what that line looks like three to five years from now. So I'll start off with the talking about one set of data that uh, Superintendent Hasenby already introduced, which is the Washington School Improvement Plan. Then Director uh, uh, Aaron's going to come up uh, and talk about another set of data. And then each of the cabinet members, we're going to kind of share the role and talking about the roles and the measurements. And then Aaron uh, is going to kind of wrap us up in this. So the Washington School Improvement Framework, we've uh, discussed this before, but it's been a while. And it's really, they got kind of three big ideas that they're focused on. And this came out of what uh, then President Obama signed into law, uh, the ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act, that went into function for all uh, schools in 2017, 2018. And it's really Washington State's accountability tied to that. And out of these three big ideas, they actually they look at nine measurements uh, in the schools. And uh, ELA proficiency, kids passing the test or not passing the test. ELA growth, how kids are actually making progress from one year to the next. Math proficiency, passing or not passing the test. Math growth. English language learners and their progress, graduation rate of our seniors, and then they have three indicators that are called the school quality student success indicators, and those are ninth graders on track when they come in as ninth graders, attendance across the whole system, and then dual credit opportunities. And those are the kinds of those are the nine measurements, and they're hit the different levels uh, depending upon when depending upon where they fit. So like. Not great on track for graduation, that's, those are high school indicators, where attendance is an indicator for all. Growth is not an indicator for high school because they only have one testing event. So you can't measure kids in high school for two different years like you can at elementary and middle school. The data is collected and it's reported as a whole school composite, and it's also broken down by student groups. And the student groups are broken into two categories. One is race and ethnicity, which is based on the seven federal categories. And then the other is program. And by program, we mean kids that qualify for low income, uh, ELL students again, and students with disabilities. These measures are then kind of weighted, and they're weighted a little bit differently at the different levels. So at elementary and middle school, uh, proficiency on the test is about 40% of the measurement. Growth is about 50% of the measurement. The uh, school, uh, school quality indicators is about 5% and ELL is about 5%. At high school, proficiency goes to about 30%. Graduation is about 50%. And then the school quality indicators is up to 15% and ELL is 5%. What the state does is they take all these indicators and they take it from across the whole state and they look at the performance <coughs> level in all these indicators and they actually plug schools into 10% brackets. <coughs> So what you'll see, uh, in, uh, in not in the graph that I put in here, but in some of the graph, you'll see what that those uh, uh, deciles are. So there's a percentage, and it's also tied to a decile. So a one decile is on the low end. That's kind of that dark orange color. And a 10 decile is on the high end. And so even within a school in these different measurements, those indicators can look differently depending upon the group and depending upon where that measurement fits within the whole state. You can get a little bit complicated to try to understand, but what we're going to just do look, look here is in these, this is the most recent information that we have, and you can see this is for Oregon Primary School. It's a continuum of 2017 to 2019. 
the state measures in three-year chunks. The last chunk was supposed to be 2021, and that was, you know, got kind of crushed by COVID. I don't know what they're going to do with that, if they're going to recycle that, how they're going to do it. But this is the most, and you can also see on the indicator over there, data is collected from 2021, 2018, 19, uh, and then the attendance is, the attendance is, is I think, 2018, the attendance is 2019, 20. So the composite picture that we have on the Washington School of Improvement Day is collecting data from a bunch of different times. COVID is really the one that's kind of, kind of pushed that. So as, the, as we get past this and we start to get kind of back on track and stuff like this, we'll kind of see data that's <coughs> pictures within the time frame that you don't have to try to figure out all those at. The main idea that I want you to see here is this is the indicator of how things, the overall performance of the school and in, in the different indicators by student groups. So when we're looking at this information, one of the things that we're trying to identify and make meaning out of is when we talk about each and every student, what does that look like? So on one hand, we have all students in there, but when we break that down, what does that look like? How is every student that comes to our system, and we're a very diverse school district, we've become very diverse over the last several years, what is their, how are, the, how are these kids doing in relationship to their peers? And what you can see in, if it's in the orange, and particularly the dark orange, that would be the lower decile. So that would be the areas where we definitely are looking towards improvement. When you get to kind of the bluer shades, those are the higher decile uh, elements. And so those are the kinds of things that we could we can celebrate on that. And so Harmigan Ridge, you can kind of see the same kind of a thing that what we've looked at. And when we, we look at the historical data, uh, unfortunately, the trend is moving in the wrong direction. So we actually, from the earlier years to now, actually, those growth rates are actually dropping a little bit. So we're paying attention to that. We're making meaning out of that. Aaron's going to talk a little bit later about our intervention, our MTSS system. I mean, just what Chris just presented, you're, he just gave us a whole big outlay of, of kind of the stories that are behind some of these numbers that we need to understand if we're going to make, you know, make, make adjustments and and uh, promote the success of all of these kids. <clears throat> so when you get to Oregon Middle School, and what you will see is the story does get a little bit better as kids move on to high school. Um, so you do see some of those colors are changing over there. So those deciles are kind of rising as when, when kids go through middle school. And then uh, when we get through the high school, you have, like for example, the decile rate of the ELA proficiency in there, those are tens which means that those that are kids in ELA are at the top tier of the state in terms of their performance. Um, and so that's, that's pretty impressive. We don't have growth, as I said earlier, because it's only one rate. What we do know, and we do know that this is a system-wide issue for us, is math. And you can see that even though over time our kids in the, in the ELA, and we're focusing on early literacy right now, to, try to build stronger foundations for kids moving into high school. But math is continuing to be something that's problematic for us. And so we're paying attention to that, trying to make meaning out of that. We've got, we've got some ideas in terms of how to take some next steps in that. That just kind of gives you a picture uh, of over time uh, what those pieces look like from the Washington School Improvement Framework. And at this point, I'll have uh, Mr. Lee come up and do his part, but <coughs> he's coming up behind any questions. Just for, yeah. a question to the score on the students with disabilities and the math proficiency rate, and just we're wondering if that's what you can test them, or? Yeah, I looked at that, and it was, it was, uh, what's the term called? This, the, when the end size is too small and oh, potentially can identify the students are. Where's the name? It starts with S. When it's suppressed. So it was suppressed, suppressed. Okay. which is different than depressed. Yes. <laughs> but, right. Yeah, so it was suppressed, and so it's the end size is, is a little bit different. Okay, thank you. Dr. Lee. Not yet. Close. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one thing that I, I am working with my doctor, I don't know if you knew that, at the University of Washington, and they talk about two kinds of data that really being valuable for us to look at in the system. 
and uh, what is the quantitative data? That's what we're looking at tonight, which is really student testing and really those attendance measures. Those are really important things to look at. But one thing that I think there's been a, a really big movement around is, is not thinking of students as numbers, but thinking of as people. And so that's where the qualitative data comes in. As we get to our goals, we're going to really kind of think about that qualitative data, which is, you know, when you walk into a school, you see teachers working really, really hard and really meeting these kids. The answer is yes. And so as we go through these things, I, I don't want to lose that fact that if you were to walk into any school tomorrow and take a look at a classroom, uh, you see a lot of really great things happening. But is it the kinds of things that we really need to do in order to really do these things? So um, with that, here it is, and uh, by the way, I think that uh, my, my two colleagues here did lie to you a little bit. This is the most recent data that we have for uh, for our SBA data. And all the kids were actually tested between third grade, and eighth grade, and then again in tenth grade. Uh, the weird thing that happened this year is that the third grade test was given to fourth graders because they're thinking about like how would they have done in third grade and the SBA didn't happen last year. So um, and the way to read this graph here is um, and you can look at the numbers a little bit more closely. Um, is that there's, there's levels of proficiency. So if you're a level one, that's uh, down in the red there. Level two is the orange. And level three is the uh, kind of light green. And level four is the dark green. And so green is where you start getting proficiency. That's where the state says that third graders are not proficient if you're above that line. If you're below that line, if you're in the sort of the yellow or the red, you are no longer proficient. And so if you look at the system, these are our math scores. Our system in the fall. Now, one thing I'll tell you is that uh, the newspapers are reporting on this data. And if you pay attention to the news about now, I think they're, they're going to start coming out with state data. And this won't seem atypical across the state. Um, we kind of found something out. Kids don't go to school. They don't do very well, so, which is you know, strange. Huh? So here's our really our math performance data in the fall. And here's our uh, English students' data as well. Again, level one's red. Level two is orange or yellow. And then level three is that kind of like green, level four is dark green. So you want a level three or four in order to find proficiency. Okay. However, this is not really all there is to tell. So if we take our data and it's called disaggregate, we start pulling out targeted groups of kids. And that's actually it's called like subgroups, I don't like that term. But targeted groups of kids, and you start comparing them to their uh, white counterparts. And so, if you look at uh, on the far left hand side, there is the number or percent of students in each grade level that were not proficient. So, if you look at third grade ELA, if you're a, a white student, then 454 percent were not proficient. If you start working your way to the right there, and the data will kind of speak for itself, but you start seeing in the red, those are the numbers that we have more students that are not proficient in that targeting group. So there's, there's things that jumped out to me right away as I was looking at this data. Look at our homeless numbers there. And I started thinking, well, how many homeless students do we have? Is it like just two kids? Well, I'll come back to this slide, don't worry. Um, how many kids do we actually have in each group? Well, it breaks down into a percentage. So our homeless, there's 53 students district-wide that are homeless, which makes up about 2.12% of our students. But if you look at, uh, you know, our, our population is becoming way more diverse. And I've talked about this quite a bit. When we were at the high school, I think we had um, something like 85% of our students who so would be considered white. Correct me if I'm wrong, yeah, about 85% of our And then uh, we started, started breaking down groups around there. A group that is actually shrinking in size is the four races. And the interesting part about that is that uh, for a long part of our history, when people were a minority, they were actually playing back. And so it's uh, really the, the awareness around race and ethnicity becomes, a, I guess, on our forefront is that more and more people are disaggregating themselves <coughs> as well. So um, as promised to go back to the slide. Um, there's some really some work to do around bilingual students, free and reduced lunch. I mean, special education, if you look at the high school, they have really incredible data, except for their special education data and performance around that. Um, black African-American students, and you pick a category, and we have some work to do. It's not all bad. Okay. 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 There's another report that talks about growth data. 
It's called the Stanford Educational Opportunity Project. And uh, what Stanford University has done is this uh, gather data throughout the whole United States, and they take the they take the amount of growth that students get within a year, and then they compare that to their social economic status. So if you look at all these little dots on here, represent a different school around the United States. And that horizontal line is right in the middle there. That represents one year's growth uh, for one year. And so Oregon falls about right on that line. So that means that we get about one year's growth out of every kid we have. Well, the two benefits for us is that we need to be more than that. But the good news is we're getting at least a year's growth. The, the vertical line represents the national median income. And one thing that was really surprising to me is that Oregon is so far on the right there. Uh, we're far right of that line. You want to know how we compare to districts around us? Start putting it in perspective. <coughs> Dallas, Sunbury, Fife, Kimpa, all the movies slightly better than us in terms of one year's growth on our state tests. And guess, guess who we're visiting? They start knocking on their doors and saying, hey, what are you guys doing for that? You know, the stuff. How does that work for you? And then summer as well, and we have contacts with that. So that's, we're doing field trips out there. And see, how do we get more than one year's of growth out of the student, especially given the fact that they're about on the same part of that line vertically that we are? Okay, hey, no, I just, I just have to. So this is the data from the No, this is. Um, this is historic data that stopped in 2019. Okay, so, then, so nothing's happened in the last year. Correct. I mean, well, last year. It's happened, happened. <laughs> but it's not on here. Correct. Right. Okay. And so here's, a, here's what I believe is that there's this Roman saying that says, whatever's in the way becomes the way. And so these goals that we're going to talk about that we'd love for you to review and, and consider as part of our strategic plan really is the way that we'd like to move forward. And uh, you know, I used to be a wrestling coach. I used to say to kids all the time that uh, I a lot of things when I leave the But if you take care of the small things, the big things always take care of themselves. And one thing that uh, we promised the principals this year was that we're not going to weaponize data. This data would be very easy to weaponize. We could start pulling apart and saying, these teachers only got 10% of their kids that I think that's important data to know and have and, and be informed about. But we're not going to weaponize it. And so these goals, as you take a look at them, each one of us is going to um, it really is defining the way forward because the education is different now. We have to teach kids differently. Um, if you look at these goals, they aren't all about academic achievement, but these are the small things that if we take care of, the big things like our state testing data, we take care of itself. And that's, that's our definite belief in our way forward. So it's not all doom and gloom. I think we have some really great plans moving forward. We're going to talk about each one of these goals. Uh, the slides you received, I think, might be a little bit out of order. Okay. 
before the healing, before the healing is finished. Than the non this one. So if you look at like four ELA, Hispanic, like my colleague's talking about, um, it's 54.54 percent. That's 54.54 percent of our Hispanic students that are not that were not proficient in the fall SBA. So, so the, wouldn't that be red? No, because it's lower than their white counterparts. The white counterparts, 77.34 percent. There's more white students that were not proficient than Hispanic students in that particular case. Because that's, that's the group we're comparing everybody else to. Why? Well, generally speaking, we talk about targeted groups of students. White is not a category that the state considers a targeted group of students. Oh, but well, all the others are comparing this data up against what is proficient or what is passing in general. Yes, exactly. Proficient would be you think of that as passing. So this, all the numbers here are the percent of our students that are not proficient. Okay. Including the white column. Including the white column. Right. Okay. But the white column just doesn't have anything to indicate that they're not doing well yeah. in the color basis. I'm just wondering why it's there. Yeah, that's the baseline. So that, yeah. Correct. So that's, that's our baseline. So what we're doing is we're comparing all these other groups that are to the right of that white column to the white column. So uh, our goals that we'd love for you to step and take a look at, but will probably be somewhat fluid, I'm sure Ed has talked about this quite a bit, is that um, I know that we're charged with really thinking about a strategic plan on the way forward. Um, these goals of the, the best of our models right now are really, uh, will give us the best results that we have. Um, I'll start off with talking about student agency, which there's been a presentation about that in the past around student agency. Um, but student agency is, uh, if you've ever been a classroom teacher, students walk into a classroom every day not ready to learn. And if you think about uh, you know, why that is, well, it's because they don't have the skills to really think about perseverance. So um, we used to call that citizenship skills. Um, perseverance became a big term probably about the late 90s. And uh, when we talk about perseverance, we just kind of hope kids had it. In reality, a lot of kids showed up and they didn't have really the ability to kind of persevere beyond their expectations or things that they were considered um, difficulties in their lives. And so agency thinks about uh, like belonging. Like why do students go to school? More times than not, it's because they have a connection with somebody at school. Um, agency is really about that efficacy. So when they do an assignment in class, do they think it really matters? And there's that whole idea that they have choice and voice in their classroom, which is um, really strong in agency. You know? Think about agency as a, as a really skill that can be taught. And whereas perseverance, you can't teach perseverance to the average. We can develop agency, which will lead to perseverance. So our measures, we'll go back and forth between these slides. As a district, you'll see that we don't have percentages there. So these are measures that we're talking about. Remember I talked about the difference between quantitative measures and qualitative measures? There's a mixture here. And you notice that the really important thing that we consider in our district to actually bring growth, remember whatever's in the way becomes the way. This is what's in the way, so it becomes our way. So if you look at student agency, it's the students with a high school and beyond plan that is relevant to them. If you look at students who report agency through regular surveys and screeners, uh, one thing I'm really excited about bringing to the district is a screener that will actually measure student agency. It'll actually measure you know, how much efficacy that they do. I was looking at Chris's presentation, and he was talking about only 47.2% of the students feel as though school's important to them, that they're being successful in schools. That's a social emotional learning indicator, right? And so these screeners, these tests that we can actually get given on a regular basis, will measure that and that student agency part as well. Um, student engagement agency is as evidenced through classroom and observation data. Um, every one of our principals has set goals around student agency in their, their uh, student improvement or school improvement plans. And students engage in extracurricular activities is also measured because why well, would students participate? So I'm going to hand this over to Mr. Rao. He's going to talk about economic achievement. Yeah, we, we, so, no. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, I just want to understand. So when you talk about student engagement, are you measuring that? I'm just trying to think, like, you know, if those programs come to you and say, are you hitting this? Or, you know, are we achieving what we want to achieve with students? And um, we look at student engagement, curricular activities, are you looking out for the finish? 
the decrease of engagement? Are you looking at students who are engaged over periods of time and the percentage of student body? Like, what does that measurement look like, and how are you going to know you are achieving what you want to achieve? Yes. All, all, everything you said is yes, and uh, I would say that the reason there's not percentages in here, like we're not saying from 50% now to 60%, because we don't have a baseline. Right. Like right. We have nothing to compare to you to bring the rules. And so the measures are going to be clear, but our baseline is not yet. And so we'll have to establish that baseline. So that's the bottom line. Yes. Very well. Okay. Absolutely. When we think about academic achievement on one level, that's pretty obvious. We've been looking at some scores and we've been looking at some data and stuff like that. But one of the one of the lens that we're using, and this is really this agency lens, which is looking at the individual child and yes, we would like kids to be more proficient, we would like kids to master in those tests and stuff like that, but really the target for us is making sure that any barriers for what kids want to be when they grow up, we're addressing that. And we realize that the academic performance of students through this process, that's a big part of that. But that's not. But it's not just whether they pass or not. There's other indicators and whatnot that we want to look at. So when we think about that, we try to identify what are some really key benchmark things that we want to pay attention to. We recognize, and there's a lot of research behind this stuff. We recognize that kids reading, knowing how to read by third grade, by the end of third grade, is really fundamental to future success. Um, eighth grade algebra ready with a math. The math as a gateway to through high school and post high school access is huge. We look at some of our data around math, but that's a really big one for us. Ninth graders on track to graduate. When kids come in, that ninth grade year is such a pivotal year that that year right there can determine so much about whether a kid's going to be successful or not. And, and regardless of what happens up to that, which is important, that year right there can be really important. So we do also uh, look at proficiency on state grade level standards. And then really this idea of, as we're thinking about transitions, there's some key transitions for kids as they go through an educational system. When you go from pre-K to K into elementary, and from elementary into middle school, and from middle school into high school. And I know, for example, when I was a middle school administrator, one of the things we had, we did separate things for kids coming into the sixth grade because it's just a different experience. Mm -hmm. And they just a lot of different expectations. And so we had to be very intentional about that work. And I know at the high school, uh, and this will actually be a little piece later too, but I'll just mention it now. I know at the high school, Matt and Cliff are really focusing on ninth and tenth graders. And they're really saying, let's capture these guys and let's pay close attention to them because those are critical aspects of what's, of what's there. And community partnerships. Maybe there's one I think we have to make this call. Maybe there's one for the next. Can I ask one question? Yes, please. Okay, so I get the, the, the algebra ready. What, what about, what are we doing for kids that um, are we having different types of math classes and things for kids that are wanting to go to be, um, go into construction or go to a trade school or to different things? What are we doing? for them as far as, as giving them the classes that they need. Yeah, so for example, on the proficiency on the state assessed grade level standard, when kids get to high school, there are pathways that they don't need that. They have other pathways through CTE and stuff like that. So they can if they might not have passed the math ELA at high school, they don't need necessarily need that because different pathways that they've chosen. So there are those different ways that, that kids can do that, particularly when they're in high school. The other piece we think dual credit fits is in the community partnerships because we can't, as an agency, award dual credit or certification or things. So that's where we think those partnerships remain a viable uh, need for many of our students yes. because they may want to go to a, a different pathway. And having that dual credit opportunity here helps to make that pathway viable. We'll, that's the interconnection of these schools. A lot of these pieces relate and interconnect with the other. Okay. In regards to some of that, I know I spent a lot of time this already, but one of the things that's really important for you to know is that I know uh, Mr. Slagle's been working with the city, um, we're working with a lot of other areas to, to actually try to get students engaged in activities and events. 
And so we want to make sure that kids are not only engaged in school-based activities, but community-based activities. And so um, I know we've been spending a lot of time, and we're going we're gonna to have data to show that. The second, the second thing is, is that are they engaged in student-led conferences? One of the things that we're going to be pushing is to, to have a little bit, of, I, I see it as student agency, uh, but that student-led conferences, uh, that rather than having this, your regular student come in, the you know, parent goes talk to the teacher, and actually having uh, the students really spend some time doing some goal setting with the teachers to be able to explain their goals and how to raise or attach to those goals. Uh, and then also, uh, we talked about assessing the goal. You, you need those community partnerships in order to do those dual credit opportunities. And so we'll have all measures on all of these areas um, by the end of this month. I know we've talked uh, quite a bit about the whole child as well, and um, you'll note that in each of these goals, we're talking about each student, and within the whole child, we're really talking about, and likewise with the other goals, we're talking about how can we help students be successful. And so when we talk about the whole child, we're really talking about the social emotional learning um, that they, that kind of the behavioral supports that they would have within that. Um, one of the things that's important, and you've heard Chris talking about it, is that with the whole child, that it's really the, the classroom, the school, combined together, along with the community. We cannot do it without our community partners, and so we know that's an important piece. And you'll see here on the screen that it really is about eliminating those barriers and finding ways for students to be able to move forward to grow and to have that success. Some of the measures that we have regarding the whole student are um, just having those increased attendance rates. Um, we have here that a target of 90%. That we want to have high school on-time graduation rates for all of our student groups. Um, that students are able to advocate. And we talked earlier and we heard Aaron talking about agency and really just giving the kids uh, tools and resources to be able to advocate for their own needs so that they can move forward and find their career path, et cetera, that uh, have been mentioned this evening. And then also, um, just through the whole child, just granting those opportunities through the activities that students are engaged in to be able to um, really reinforce that uh, behavior that's possible. And so that's what I mean with regard to the whole child. And, Mr. Lee is going to wrap us up with the student support systems. So back in the old days, we used to, well, we used to put 25 kids and 30 kids in the class and just kind of hope for the best. And <laughs> kind of that one size fits all. Um, it's really that industrial model that's out there. Uh, we're finding that over time, guess what, that's not actually working for all kids. <clears throat> and so really creating systems, I'll go back a slide here, sorry, creating systems that really are, uh, you know, leverage really the strengths of students but also really think about what can we do differently and support kids within classrooms and outside of classrooms so that they become successful because that one size fits all model doesn't work and it's not part of the future as well So for kids. So how do we measure those student support systems that are out there? Um, it's really the growth rate for students experiencing personal systemic barriers to achievement or opportunity. So um, that's actually what they call that, that quantitative data. So how often are kids not being successful? Uh, students being standard on benchmark assessments Again, the benchmark assessments are like along the way, we actually stop and say, are the kids where they need to be at after the quarter or after you know, that unit's over as well? Uh, reduction in the number of opportunity gaps for students. And so we'll see a lot of things. I'll just put that, that red and green slide that all the numbers out that are confusing. Sorry about that. But if you look at that reduction in the number of opportunity gaps for students, that actually shows the opportunity gaps that some students have. Um, last one's reduction in risk factors. For at risk students, um, there's a lot of things like drug use, for example, there's a lot of at risk factors around that abuse. Um, it's the community connection that Chris is talking about. I'm going to stop there before I go on the next slide. Any questions so far? So, when you talk about how uh, you're going to increase, you know, so you're going to want to reduce the risk factors so you increase things for kids to do so that they don't. So, I was just wondering. Besides just like having the sports and a few of the clubs, are you going to do any like bigger um, events that, that all, like, like let's say that the high school can attend or the, like, like for example, flag like football that everybody can attend or uh, community 
get? Just are, are you guys looking at anything like that? Yes, we're actually looking for different ways to involve kids because here's the thing is that, again, it's not one size fits all. So what, what attracts some kids to some like sports? Um, some kids aren't into sports. Some kids are really into chess. Yeah. Kids that are already or into chess. A community where there's all kinds of different things Absolutely. happening. Yeah, and there's the partnerships that we have through our career technical education classes provide that opportunity to connect with the community and other schools, which is what I think you're saying. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, Jeff, do you have a question? Yeah, Jeff, you're on So the a big part of this, this goal is really around not only intervention, but enrichment as well, which is where it's ended up. So that's, I think that's what you're asking about, yeah. those yeah. opportunities. Uh, a big part of that is through core instruction and making sure we challenge kids from where they are. And if you go back to student agency, um, learning has to be individualized and important to them. So if you give a worksheet out to every student in the class and that, that student is like advanced, it's done in five minutes, what do you do with that? Well, that's not student agency anymore. And so that's, uh, these goals, they do overlap somewhat. Um, the idea is that you have to plan for that. And you already know who the kids are that are going to be selling beyond that. And making sure that you provide opportunities for them to enrich not a different learning, but the same learning. Right. And so if you're really working on math, for example, they are deeper. You know, working on you know, some kind of social studies assignment, they are deeper. And you give them an opportunity to have to thrive with that. In addition to that, um, a lot of after school activities. Like uh, in most school, we used to have pockets. We should shoot those up. So those kids really got into that. Um, robotics is big. It's probably still is it's big. So just providing those opportunities for kids that are exploring them, preparing them for that, and have some fun at school. It's really cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, just because these are our new goals, doesn't mean we haven't been working on them since the beginning of the school year. And so I said earlier, I began this talking about like these goals found us and you know what's in the way becomes a way. Well, we've actually worked on these things already. And so if you look at student agency, for example, um, there's metrics for how we actually measure student agency, and those are listed up there. But our objectives, these are things that we've been actually working towards and accomplished this year already. And we're so uh, a question came up with the moving goals, and it's probably that he was really brilliant, by the way. And she says, Well, all these goals are great, but what about the kids right now? So if I'm in third grade right now, what happens to me? Well, the reality is that we never really stopped working on any of these things. Um, but by actually having a focus around these goals allows us to be more intentional about that and do an even better job around that. So, so we didn't want you to have the impression that we don't have progress on these or your measures are out of progress like this one. You know what? I saw that at the middle school presentation because they have really incorporated things that engage kids. I mean, I was really, I could tell that they were purposely putting things in place that engage the kids and reward, you know, just yeah. fun and engaging things. And so it was very obvious. And yeah. yeah, and I'm a big believer in, you know, what you measure, what you celebrate, what you can find is what you get. Uh -huh. And so if you think about, like, our, our school improvement plans, uh, every one of our schools is definitely around the student agency. And so that's one of our big measures of the school. Like on the 28th, which is an in-service day for teachers, uh, every one of our schools is working on agency. I got one question. Yes, sir? Uh, who made this slide, this uh, presentation? Um, <laughs> it was me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I did it. So is it, is it, is it intended for us or the community parents? Who's yes. It it's for both, and uh, my next slide here after we get done talking about this year's measures, uh, we'll actually talk about us reaching out for additional feedback on these goals. So even though we presented these sort of as a finished product, they are not. And so we need to reach out to our stakeholders and ask them for what their needs are, what their ideas are as we move forward. So that, that partnership that we're looking for. So this is for the community? This is what the slide show for you? Yes, I'd say yes okay. for now. And... Uh, one of the next steps we'll take is gather some feedback and share a little bit of ideas about that. But we want to restructure everything you've seen thus far and reformulate that into a new strategic plan 
that's rebranded around some of the color scheme and uh, whatnot that you've seen through the, the Letty logo. So we want to take that, repackage that in a final product, and ideally bring that to you sometime next month. I would just like some of the data to not be all facing, you know, all these students against white with no colors for them. So, because to me, it's just it's hard to see our white students failing in anything. In this on slide number nine, just it's hard. I'm a parent as well, and I'm looking at it, and I it doesn't make sense. So I would just urge you to make things a little easier to understand uh, if we're going to be talking to parents in the community about this. Because I I'm not I'm, I'm a little sick, and I'm not the brightest person here in the room, I'm sure, but I, I can't make heads or tails of this. And when we got information from WASTA um, about, you know, different demographics and where they've scored, it was always up against what is the academic standard so we could see across the board. So what we saw from them in Bellevue was that uh, Asian students were very proficient in math. So if I'm looking at this on, you know, slide number nine, six ELA, six math, you go down, you know, one number is green, one number is red. So I'm just saying the average parent that they're looking at this and we're trying to communicate with them, we need to be able to just a little bit easier to understand. Uh, to respond back to that, that data is not intended to go in a strategic plan. The things are on mission, vision, goals, outcomes, the main work of the district, that's what would go in the strategic plan. The academic data is for your review and what we share publicly at the board meeting, not to go in what we would say is the final product of a strategic plan. I understand. Just it's a little hard to understand, but I, that's just my opinion. Uh, before we talk about my piece, Director Kimbo, you said that it didn't need necessarily a response, but your question was what about these kids. When we did PLC, the, there's four PLC questions. One is, what do we want kids to be able to do? Second question is, how will we know? Third question is, what if they don't? Fourth question is, what if they already do? And so I have a meeting. We have we have high cap building coordinators at elementary and secondary and I have my meeting with these guys on Monday and what they have been doing since school started is they're interviewing every single high cap kid, sitting down one on one with them and trying to get to understand who they are, what makes them tick, what are their aspirations and whatnot. Because our goal is to develop, for lack of a better word, IEPs, individual educational plans for them. So to try and put together student profiles of these kids and find out what their interests are. So that gives us information about what is it that we need to do that we're not doing. Because you're right, these kids, if they already get it and it's not challenging to them and that's not the thing that's happening for them, uh, they're not growing. Yeah. And in the days of, well, they don't really need us, they're going to be fine without us. And Ed's raised a couple of boys that you know, they, they may have that attitude as they came through. That's not that's not the way we think about it anymore. Yeah. Because they do need us and they could change the world yeah. if we were able to capitalize on what their particular proficiencies and their strengths and their aspirations are. So that's what we're doing. We're trying to get a, a, an inside look at those kids and get a better picture of, of who they are. So I like that because it's not just moving them up over. It. That's right. Because that doesn't it's like deeper thinking. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the idea around high cap that gets really misunderstood is that they're just smarter than everybody else, but what the high, highly capable students are, they learn different. They, they, yes, they're very bright, but they have a different way that they see the world, and they can sometimes be your biggest troublemakers. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not because they're <laughs> problems, they just, yeah. you know, they just see the world differently. Yeah. The more we can understand that, the more we can address that need. So you're exactly right. We do tend to focus a lot on the kids that are in the gaps and missing opportunities. We cannot ignore those kids either. So that's what we've been working on with our highly capable program. I'm pretty excited to see what we can do. And then just for the academic achievement, the kind of things we've been working on, I've already sort of mentioned this. I, I said it, told you that uh, Aaron and I are both working in ELA and math, and we're really trying to, when I talk about this idea of a strategic plan and everybody getting clear on what the focus is, one of the things that we are really concentrating on very heavily right now is this idea of what a guaranteed viable curriculum looks like. And as Aaron and I have been doing it, we've been thinking we kind of want to change the language on that. Instead of guaranteed viable curriculum, should be guaranteed viable student outcomes. Because the curriculum can kind of mean something that kind of puts people in a little bit of a box, We've been working really hard to try to get away from the idea that the magic's in the material. 
the magic's always in the teaching. It's always in the relationship. That's where it's always going to be. There's no such thing as a perfect curriculum. So in this same idea that the more clear we get on what our targets are and how we're going to get to them, that's exactly the work we're doing with teachers, which is the more clear they are on what a first grade student should learn in math, from the beginning to the end to be paired for second, the more clear that teacher is about that, the, the better it's going to go for every kid in that system because in their times when they're uh, addressing their instructional uh, pre pre preparation, the curriculum choices, PLC activities when they're talking about it. So that's what, when we had our math groups now, <coughs> we told them that. We're going to spend a bunch of time you may not know what a first grade math student or a second grade math student in the beginning end should look like, but when we're done here, we will. Because that's really key. Uh, because once you understand that, you have uh, so many other things unlocked that the, the boundaries and the barriers for kids unlock, opportunities unlock. So when we've been trying to do some of that work, we've been really focusing in on what does that mean. And even the, team, even the groups that we're not working with Specifically, we're having conversations with middle school and high school. The principals there, they're going in and they're working on their guaranteed viable, you know, establishing their essential standards and stuff like that. We're having that conversation with them and calibrating what those outcomes look like for them as well. And then so, um, and I, I talked about what the high school is doing with focusing on those kids. But all of this is being generated, I, you know, when I said that, you know, if you don't know where you're going, anywhere will get you there. And then, the, the thing that I'm so excited about is we know where we're going. And uh, Ed Hatsubir has to be has really come in and really provided a push for this. We've been kind of just seeing this just start to go like this and get more finely tuned. And when all those oars are kicking in the, in the same direction, then that's going to cross the finish line first. <laughs> We're just talking about this year. Yeah. So I don't have much else to say about the community. You got a four. Did you say you did that earlier or really well? I said, I said well. earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just say, with, with regard to the whole trial, uh, we really are interested in uh, students being safe and seen and welcome. And uh, some of the metrics that we have around that include discipline and then um, certainly support work. And uh, the question came up earlier, maybe it was you, uh, Joanne, that was talking about, you know, what else are you going to do? And, and it's like all the ball was one of the things you said. But, Within this, uh, some of the objectives that we have is that it's not just surveys, but kids have an opportunity to participate in, which gives us valuable information. But um, some of the other extracurricular activities and, and the cultural events that we've done in the past and trying to do again, coming up, those are the types of things that we are effective to do. Um, and the last one around student support systems, remember the, the focus is on the student, and there's some appreciations that are approach it. Um, yeah. Like GVC is guaranteed viable curriculum, that's what Steve was talking about. Um, we look at SEL, social emotional learning, and that's the really the overlap between supporting one child and thinking about student agency. And then if you look at our data dashboard home run, we talked about that, presented that during a, a couple of four weeks ago. And that's basically we're pulling data together in one spot. It would create risk groups and principals do not focus on kids who aren't doing well. Um, and then TPAP is Teacher Principal Evaluation Project. Did I get that right, Steve? Yes. Um, and that rate of reliability. So we're getting principals together and as they go into classrooms, is making sure that they are all tuned together on what good instruction is and they're giving the right feedback in the right way to teachers. And then the MTSS, Multi Tiered Systems of Support, which was that umbrella piece we'll talk about here today. With that, um, I'll make sure that we are going to reach out and get stakeholder for input for our strategic goals. <coughs> we have lots of different groups that, uh, since Ed walked into the door, that we have been visiting. We've talked to student groups constantly, consistently. 
and really, our, uh, even during our levy campaign, we were talking about all the groups that will listen to us. I'm not just saying, but it goes both ways and talk to us as well. Like, what are their needs? Um, what will they think about these goals? And uh, you know, as we package this and, and put it out there, they want partnerships out there. So we don't want to do this in a vacuum. Uh, if you have any questions. Back and you're not, we'll work to create things in a, in a synthesized, coherent, published way. Uh, that's the Rashad part of the just so we can do the reading. <laughs> <laughs> and some of the feedback we want to get from, from staff as well as characters about priorities. Just simple questions. What activities do you think we could have that we don't have already? We might ask that without need for professional development support. So, when we get to the May or retreat, we would want to have that data and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Because some of these measures we're seeing are not traditional strategic plan measures. We're trying to really get to the kid level. And what you're seeing with us is really trying to look through the lens of student eyes. So you don't see adult measures. You see all student measures. And so we know we need to create some systems. But how would we know? And how would we assess? And so we're working to bring by May screener recommendations, intervention recommendations, other supports that we would create. And you're 100% correct. And because we want this to live for a multi-year phase, we would have to get the right data to know where our benchmarks are, and then be able to set more targeted measures from there year after year. But we would hope that that feedback, we could get clarity, bring those recommendations back to you about focus areas for the next year and beyond, uh, and have that be a part of our main conversation. I think it's so important that we're moving, we're actually understanding that we moved to this area where where it's all about the test and it's no fun. It's like it, we have to spend every minute we have with them just inputting information into the student or whatever. And that we've seen that doesn't work. It's like no student is going to engage in that if that's the way we're doing. And so it looks good to see that we're doing more, you know, like especially elementary. What kid wants to just come to school and not have fun and do some, you know, and just treat the social emotional and any. Just the, it's the annual, it's part of the board policy, and it's just the annual report of how are we doing about the kids that uh, drop out, what do we know about them, where do they go, and so it's just that report there. The names, the actual names are omitted because that's not necessary for the report. That just gives you the reason to get it all and what we know about. Yes. And what happens is where it says where it says no information, for example, mm -hmm. they just lost. They can't find them. They can't find them in the EDS system, or they, they were supposed to transfer to another school, but the request for registration came and in their communication, usually the counselors are the ones following up on it. They just disappeared. Mm -hmm. So that sometimes that happens, and then in other cases you see that we, we find them, we put them in Grand Alliance. One of them didn't make it through, but one's actually going through Grand Alliance. So sometimes they just drop away. We don't know where they're at.
has a presentation on mental health that she's working on preparing. We needed time tonight to do that. So that is a how ironic. We're so proud of the work that she's doing in advocacy. Um, Thank you. 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 Thank you.